Socialism Rising's popularity. <laughs> rising pop Socialism's rising popularity. This I, I, it's just amazing how effective the left has been. National Review reports the American Culture and Faith Institute recently conducted a survey of adults 18 and over. It shows not only how deeply divided Americans are on some issues, but also how their view of the nation stands, in many cases in stark contrast to our nation's founding principles. Most Americans, 58%, see themselves as politically moderate, while a quarter identify as conservative and 17% as liberal. Those who were both socially and fiscally conservative were 6% of the population. That's amazing. I'm a member of just 6% of the population being socially and fiscally conservative. That's it? Wow. But those differences don't reveal the greatest divide and danger to America's future. The most alarming result, according to George Barna, who's involved in these matters, was that four out of every ten adults say they prefer socialism to capitalism. Do you folks believe that? Has that been your, is that your experience? Do you think four out of ten Americans would say they prefer socialism to capitalism? I would not be surprised. I think the left's effect has been that uh, effective. The, an effective effect. How's that? One eight Prager seven seven six. You're listening to the Dennis Prager Show. Hello, my friends. Dennis Prager here. According to this latest survey that I have read to you, fifty. No, what what was the number here? Four. Yes, four out of every. Uh, 10 adults in the United States say they prefer socialism to capitalism. That is a perfect introduction to the latest video by Ami Horowitz, who just went to another happy place. He uh, he has a new travel agency. It's called Happy Tours because he, he only goes to happy places. So, Ami, you went to Venezuela. Venezuela, right? Let me think. Hmm, I could think of a few people who don't. I could think, uh, I suspect that the number of people who want to leave Venezuela is greater than the number who want to visit. That'd be, it'd be a close number. I'd, I'd be interested to see if that, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that would include every single person in Venezuela outside of Maduro. He made a video about what uh, what it is like there, and he asked people what they thought of socialism. What I, uh, as usual, it was a great video. He he is uh, he's courageous. He's bright. He gets people to talk. These his videos are fantastic. I wish, though, even though is a little too strong, I wish you would have asked them. Maybe you couldn't. In light of what you are describing, and I'll have you summarize what they described in a moment, how do you explain the election of Maduro? What would they say? Are you talking about the, the American Democrats who I No, who I no, no, no. The Venezuelans. Ah. You know, it's so interesting. The, so to, to set it up for, for, for your audience, I'm sure most of you guys know... Um, as students of Dennis Prager, but I'll just, it bears repeating. So Venezuela is essentially in a death spiral right now, and it's 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 purely caused because of its socialist policies, extraordinarily uh, uh, generous programs to its to its people, uh, t- traditional socialist uh, country, and because of a variety of things, uh, particularly the, the 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 drop in oil prices and their petrol state, they're really out of cash, out of food, uh, and violence has exploded across the country. So what's interesting about the whole situation there is the takeaway from the people themselves. Now, the people themselves don't walk away with the idea that, hey, you know what, maybe we should move into more capitalist society. What they say is, well, they just fail to take care of us. So we need somebody who will come in who will take better care of, uh, of us. That's kind of their takeaway from the whole situation of Venezuela, and that's really the unfortunate part. Bravo. That is exactly what I learned 
from a Prairie University viewer in Venezuelan who called into the show, a 28-year-old guy, and I said to him, I said, so Maduro is so unpopular, the country is in, I didn't use your term, but I it was similar, a death spiral. What does the opposition say? He said, well, Dennis, please understand, the opposition is left-wing also. They, what they people do is they think Maduro is corrupt. Not that socialism is corrupt. Maduro is corrupt. Yeah, it, it's, um, that's why I have very little hope. Listen, not just Venezuela. I think South America in general has right. fallen to this trap. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, so is Western Europe and so is the United States. That's right. That's why there's very good reason for pessimism. <laughs> I mean, it's just the fact the... The left has has brainwashed people into believing that something that cannot work, the welfare state, uh, works. It's it's a, it's a phenomenon of history that hundreds that billions of people with access to other opinion, although that's really only true in the U.S. I take that back. But that billions of people believe that this is an answer. Were you uh, were, were you afraid uh, in that in those areas the the barrios that you entered? Oh my God! Listen, you know that I've been in dangerous places. You know that I've been in dangerous situations, and I have to say this is one of the most dangerous places I remember going to. It's it's it, it, the, the killing and the death is so, not just forget the barrios for a second. Which, by the way, most people in Caracas live in barrios. The majority of people live in these, in these very dangerous. All right, places. hold on. I really want to hear because it's very rare for Ami Horowitz to get scared. You can see his videos, right? We, there's a link to him on, on Prager, DennisPrager.com. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, everybody. I'm Ami Horowitz's videos are seen on Fox News. We have him on every time he produces one. Every one is memorable and extremely to be both entertaining and educational is not common, but they are. He went to Venezuela, and you say that this was, I mean, you went, I want people to understand, he went on a boat with Syrian refugees from Lebanon to Greece. So would you say you were more scared in Venezuela? First of all, boat is really overstating it. Correct. Uh, uh, By the way, I feel like this interview is missing something. Triple G, I don't know where he's, he, is he sleeping? I, I no, no, that's, oh, I, that's very funny. I, I felt something was wrong with this thing from the beginning. Okay, well, Triple G is out today. Uh-huh. Okay, so, okay, no So no you blame. are very perceptive. <laughs> but on the, I, to, to Sullivan's credit, he did, in fact, ask whether we should play it. But I, I don't want to blame anybody for saying no. Fair enough. Okay, Fair enough. okay. Go, go ahead. So, so, all right. No, no, I was. I, I would say uh, I was more nervous about the, um, the my, my little raft trip across the Aegean Sea. But I would say on land, I can't remember <laughs> okay. a time. Right. I was more was because you know the situation is like this: is that the, the the violence is so random, right? If I when I'm in, let's say the Palestinian territories or Janine or or with the Muslim Brotherhood, I know that if I play the role that I play, which is usually uh, a self-hating Jew, then I'm fine. In this case, there is no role you can play to be fine. I mean, we, I'll just give you a couple of examples of what we faced there. And we, on camera, we were shooting, and in the video, if you guys watch the video, you guys can see it. We are shooting some B-roll, and just getting shots of Caracas to kind of cut into the video. And we hear pop, 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 and we turn around. There's a guy who was shot right in front of us. I did. I noticed that. And there's a police uh, yes. officer who just looks at him and walks away. That's right. Yeah, and you mentioned that. Look, the police officer is just looking and walking away. It was it was an inc- incredible. We were held up in gunpoint, had our equipment stolen, thousands and thousands of equipment. Thank God we were okay, but two guys in motorbikes dro- drove by. And and worse of all, I mean, really, it, this was this shook me up quite a bit. Our fixer, the person who set us up in the barrio and made a deal with the barrio boss so that we can film there safely because otherwise you're not going to survive, she was murdered the day after we left. Oh. I mean, it was it, it is really, it is oh. Malthusian. There, there really is no other word to say it. Uh, what's happening in Venezuela is something that we haven't seen before, at least not, not in my lifetime. 
just a total collapse of the but I But you, the reason that I have so little optimism is that people don't know why it's happening. Well, I mean, uh, I know why it's happening. No, no. People in Venezuela. No. Yeah, no. They, they Absolutely. More than that, and, and this is the reason why I made the video. While, while I, it's what's really important, obviously, to, to show what's happening in Venezuela, at least for our purposes, it's more important to inform our electorate of what the road is like if you go down this path. And the path I'm talking about, and the statistic you mentioned before, which is so, so just scary, is this notion that socialism is okay. You know, if you start with socialism and light, right, if you look at your, again, and I've said this before in your show, and I, I can't stress it enough, my reason for being is so that this country does not become like Europe. And Europe is simply, it is so inconceivable to, to you, because, by the way, you know, Europe is, by all measures, a, you know, what it's called socialist light, right? It's definitely democratic socialism, which, by the way, technically so is Venezuela. They're just in a more extreme version of that. But is it, is it so inconceivable that if Greece didn't get the bailout, that what we see in Venezuela could have happened in Greece? Is that so inconceivable? It's not to me. And that's the heart of Europe. So the, that's the see. point I want to make, ultimately, if, if this video has one legacy is to look at people and say, this road that you want to go down, whether it be a Bernie Sanders road or whoever it happens to be, that this road leads to very bad and dark places. By the way, uh, totally coincidentally, my column this week, National Review and uh, Town Hall and elsewhere, uh, is on the most difficult, my theory is that it's the most difficult addiction for people to rid themselves of, and that is entitlements addiction. And the whole column is about EA, as I call it, entitlements addiction. And uh, once on it, people want more. As opposed, the person is a heroin addict, knows on some level, this is not good for me. This is not the most moral way to live. But people who are uh, addicted to entitlements think it's moral and it is a good way to live. So it's a combination of destructive and idealistic at the same time. It's very hard to fight. You're right. I mean, you had, you had a whole show about it. It was yesterday uh, on, or the day before on, on, uh, on, on, a, on that exact point. And, and, and you're absolutely right. And that's the reason why the Venezuelans you talk to aren't saying, hey, let's give ourselves less entitlement so that we can ultimately, uh, we can ultimately uh, flourish more. They're saying the exact opposite. Give me more. Give me yeah. more. That will get us out of it. And by the way, it's no different if you go to Europe and you ask people. That's hey, right. Listen, I mean, you know, people think Germany, uh, you know, the, the heart of the economic engine of Europe. Germany over the last 10 years has had one-tenth of 1% one growth in GDP. I mean, the, Europe, Europe, European growth is anemic and getting worse. We had, and they're, I mean, you think we had a bad 10 years here. I mean, they've had a far worse 10 years. Sweden, Norway, all these, France, all these countries that these, these leftists here in America look at and say that's the final evolution of man, that's what we should be like, they're all drowning also. They're all economic failures. You and know, you, I just want failures? you to know, b- before I say goodbye, I want you to know you really touched me when you said your reason for being is to prevent America from becoming Europe. That's exactly right. As I say... The uh, the the American Revolution was fleeing Europe. The leftist revolution is to take us back there. You couldn't have said it better, and and uh, and and it 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 it, uh, it shatters me. It shatters me to think that there, we have a body politic, a significant body politic that wants to do exactly. Well, that. every everybody should see it. Aside from going through my website, how do they go directly to you? They can go amihorts.com. That's con- uh, that is complex. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I hope that. <laughs> yeah, I try to make it as hard as yeah. possible to figure out how to get there. Stay safe, which telling you that is somewhat silly. We'll be back. I'm Dennis Prager. Oh, boy, is there a lot to talk to you about. Marcel in Glendale, California. In the 70s, I lived in Venezuela, and it was paradise. Now, now look at it. It must hurt people who knew Venezuela then. But people don't draw any conclusions. None. Victor Davis Hanson, who is just magnificent, writes about what's happening in the United States. The rapper Snoop Dogg released a video shooting a mock-up of the president. 
Rapper Bow Wow wants to pimp the First Lady. What a difference a few months make. Not long ago, rapper Kendrick Lamar issued an album whose cover showed young rappers on the White House lawn celebrating the death of a white judge. He received an invitation to the White House. A cut from his To Pimp a Butterfly album was Barack Obama's favorite song of the year. There is now something called the resistance, which by its nomenclature poses that its opposition to Trump is reminiscent of European partisan resistance to Hitler. Affluent progressives are now on the barricades to stop another Holocaust. Cities now nullify federal law in the spirit of the old Confederacy. A federal judge doesn't enforce federal law because he says he does not like what the president and his associates said in the past during the campaign. Op-ed writers overseas want e- wait eagerly for the president's assassination. At CNN, Fareed Zakaria, wrist slap for past plagiarism, melts down while screaming of Trump's bullsh. He says the whole word. Madonna says she was she has quote thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House unquote. And he continues. Yep, 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 indeed. I'd like you to see my column today, please, on entitlements addiction. I make the case in writing that I spoke about to you on the program. We have to undo the damage of teaching Americans that socialism is better than capitalism. Socialism spends the money that capitalism produces. Socialism has never earned a penny, a euro, a drachma, a ruble. All wealth in in human history has been produced by capitalism. It is the only way to take people out of poverty. That needs to be taught. You know why? Because it is moral and because it is true. I'm Dennis Prager. We continue. The eyes of Hugo Chavez looking over Caracas, but now he's dead. And the poor living there in the barrios, historically his political base, have turned against the movement he created. Bread, medicine, toilet paper, these are just some of the basic necessities Venezuelans are struggling to find. The falling global oil prices have hit the country hard. Public services are disappearing one after the other. American officials are warning the country is on the brink of collapse. Venezuela is in a state of emergency right now. Its currency has been devalued 92% since the last two years alone. The amount of hyperinflation here is actually just unbelievable. You need a backpack full of money to buy dinner. Venezuela bit everything on the price of oil remaining high and with government revenue 95 percent dependent on it the plunge in oil has sent the economy reeling. As a result GDP is predicted to contract 5.8 percent in 2016 the third straight year of negative growth and Venezuela has the world's largest inflation rate the IMF expecting it to reach 700 percent this year. There were poverty reduction programs that were very much tied to political loyalty. They were not set up to be sustainable. It started with a theory, a theory that capitalism is bad, a theory that private property and a division of labor is bad. One of the first things Hugo Chavez did was seize the land. He seized over a thousand industrial enterprises, nationalizing them. He He took over the energy grid. He took over the production of oil, which is today the only way that Venezuela generates revenue. Now that oil prices are down and the government did not have the provision to, to save for rainy days, now Venezuelans are left with nothing in a country that only produces oil, that imports everything. Venezuela could grow most of its own food thanks to large expansion of fertile land. 
but through the years most of its agriculture has been abandoned and other farms like this one have been expropriated by the government and production has collapsed. The government just lost control of the situation. Last week, you'll remember President Nicolas Maduro had to hike petrol prices by 6,000%. So with all this, fears are growing that Venezuela soon won't be able to afford its debt repayments. In fact, bonds are already trading at levels that suggest a default is priced in. Venezuelans in Caracas, in the capital city, we uh, have a, a very uh, tough time uh, accessing uh, basic necessities. But the people uh, in the interior of the country, in the states, in the province, have it even worse. And uh, we're not just talking about um, um, medicine. We're not just talking about uh, basic things such as toilet paper. We're talking about food and that's where the situation escalates. Lines down the block for just basic necessities, lying down the blocks for public transportation that is insufficient, you know, and then a lot of people talk about the toilet paper with the government setting up a set price so poor people could afford a, um, toilet paper. Even in the driving rain, Venezuelans started their day in search of food, expecting to see the usual grim queues that form at government stores. Not today. The only stores with affordable food are shut, closed for the National Workers' Holiday, the sign explains. It says sorry and thank you. People walked away empty-handed but full of dread, wondering where their next meal might come from. And here's the thing, these people aren't allowed to come back tomorrow. Food is rationed here, doled out according to the last number on your government ID. Carlos Chirinos explains his turn is today. His number is five. Cinco. Cinco. Hoy me toca a mí. Cinco. Hoy y el miércoles. El miércoles. So he's saying that just today and Wednesday can he buy things. And because it's closed today, he's out of luck. The things that we have experienced, the things that we have seen here in Venezuela are absolutely insane. We went to the, some of the restaurants and uh, the, all the prices on the menu are in uh, paper and they uh, like taped onto the menu because they have to change it uh, every week and sometimes even more than that. Uh, it's changing that fast. Uh, it's, it's really like it's interesting and you brought up the gun free zones. That's the most interesting part to me is no one is allowed to have a gun and this is the murder capital of the world. So we walk into the hotel at night because we're a little crazy. We're told by everyone don't go out and we went out. Uh, there was no one anywhere. It was like a ghost town uh, and when we get back the security guard is hiding behind a door because he doesn't have a gun and the other the bad people all have guns. The, the situation in Venezuela is dire and it is dire in many different ways socially politically as as well as economically. As you can see we were middle-class people and now we're not even that anymore. Just look at the kitchen. This is how we live now that we have no water. Now it's just arrived. Water and electricity are both being rationed. Officials say it's due to an ongoing drought, but most Venezuelans believe these shortages are due to wider political instability. Everyone is feeling the pinch. Until last year, working four jobs, I earned about $300 a month. This year, working the same four jobs, I only make $100, and this will keep diminishing as our currency devalues. Ephraim is a trauma surgeon working in Caracas's public hospitals. Free health care was one of the foundations of the Chavist regime. These are all the bandages we've got, six little rolls. And these here are made in China, very poor quality. It tears your skin off. We've seen food shortages, medicine shortages, now basic services, electricity, even water that is not reaching a big portion of Venezuela's population. Basic food supplies are being sold on the black market for 10 or 20 times the price supplied by the government. Without the black market, the country would crunch to a halt. At the supermarkets, the queues go down the street. There is no even coffee. If they can find sugar, they take hot water with sugar. 
in the morning and they try to eat once at three o'clock to 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 be able to sleep until the next day. So this is a true country in collapse. This is a hyperinflation and socialism reaching its ultimate end. Government officials say the state of emergency will allow better distribution of resources. The state of emergency has little to do with the economic situation. It's more to do with how a government that has lost all popular support, how can they control a society? When you start asking about uh, the alternative explanations the government has given, what they call an economic war, or the aggression, or the imperialist agenda, it does not poll, it does not even register with Venezuelans. So um, it's all seen as excuses. The criminality is brought on by the government as a way to control the people. Like, we were driving by, and our fixer showed us this huge, huge building. And he was like, yeah, this is a building, a skyscraper, uh, that's being run by a criminal organization. There's people squatting in there, and this is where all the kidnapping happens. But you walk around town, and there's government-mandated signs saying gun-free zones everywhere you go, and no smoking signs, while there's massive, incredible crime. By some estimates, there were nearly 4,000 murders here last year. You have all these are not only uh, civilians and military and uh, Chavistas in opposition, you also have criminal gangs battling it out. It's a recipe, as we have seen in the Middle East, for chaos. The criminals here are running around just doing whatever they want, kidnapping whoever they want, murdering whoever they want with pure impunity. Meanwhile, the government sends in their agents to every business, to every private a place to every public park to make sure that everyone has mandated signs that say no smoking, no guns, and you can't be racist. The way things are going, there might just be a, a revolt. People are looting. There was looting even over the weekend, right after the state of emergency was declared. I've uh, seen video footage, and, and they, the people are just taking into shopping malls, and uh, the military, if the military files out, fires on the people, uh, you'll see something akin to the Arab Spring. Venezuelans have to place our fingers on fingerprint scanners sure. in order to buy medicine and food. Uh, they tell us that uh, there's controls over uh, your ID number. You can only buy on certain days. You can only buy certain uh, quantities of food. So uh, this all boils down to a, a model, a political and economic control model mm -hmm. that has uh, decimated the the economic apparatus that has decimated national production, uh, expropriating businesses, expropriating um, uh, the producers okay. of food and, and basic uh, means. I have called for the armed forces and militia to hold national military exercises to prepare us for any scenario. Yes, while his citizens are starving, Maduro decided now would be a great time to spend money on the biggest military exercise in Venezuelan history. The military has become the main basis, the main pillar of support of the Chavismo regime. That is very important for everyone to know. Uh, what we're seeing, even though Mr. Maduro is a civilian, is basically a military government. From my experiences here, this government here is run by criminals. This is a criminal state. When we ask the people, yes, the situation is bad now, but how do you see the situation in the next 12 months? Uh, the Venezuelans add, uh, answer, uh, over 62 percent of Venezuelans answer, that it will get worse. And uh, over 60 percent of Venezuelans blame the government directly for the crisis. Opinion polls suggest 70 percent of Venezuelans think President Maduro should step down. He recently suggested punishing business owners who've ceased operations by jailing them and seizing their factories. An idle factory will be a factory handed over to the people. The opposition won the majority of seats in the National Assembly last December, but since then nearly all of its decisions have been struck down by the Supreme Court. So now almost two million people have signed the opposition's petition to force Maduro out of office. The question right now to, to point out is that uh, we all know that uh, President Maduro is not going to finish his term. There is no way under the circumstances that, uh, that President Maduro is going to finish. He's not going to go quietly. Uh, as a matter of fact, what we've seen since the December 6 elections, where the opposition won uh, the National Assembly in a landslide victory, is uh, the whole uh, state, not only the executive power, not only the president, but al also the Supreme Tribunal, also the armed forces, 
closing ranks with the president uh, in setting up obstacles to that political change that Venezuelans expressed uh, as their will. Si ustedes trancan la vía democrática, nosotros no sabemos lo que pueda pasar en este país. Venezuela is a bomb that in any moment can explode. Where is this country headed and can this crisis be resolved in a peaceful manner? Well, I doubt it because uh, all we have reached uh, the peak of the tensions between the government and the opposition. And uh, that's why I don't think there is uh, going to be a peaceful solution unless the government led the, the democratic mechanism, like the recall referendum, in order to, to, to try to bring some changes in the country. So, and I don't see, because the, the government is trying to delay all the process, the democratic process, and trying to use some force. For those people who do like Bernie Sanders, come to Venezuela, check it out. Hi everybody, Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. I hope you're doing well. I've received a bunch of requests to talk about Venezuela, which is currently having a giant Florida-style economic sinkhole open up under its population, dropping 70% of them into dire poverty. Now, Venezuela, of course, is a middle-income country, about three hours flight from Miami, a little over 30 three million people and for the past two two and a half years the country has been falling apart at the seams it is experiencing the kind of political and social and economic collapse that hardly ever occurs in a relatively developed country outside of direct warfare it is in significant danger in my opinion of becoming a failed state with all that implies now, President Nicolas Maduro, a former bus driver, um, is the heir of the extremely popular President Hugo Chavez, who died of cancer in 2013. Chavez rose to power uh, in 1999 on the back of anti-U.S. sentiment and high oil revenues. Chavez uh, put in a giant statist economic model, which he called 21st century socialism, which, as it turns out, has pretty much everything in common with 19th century socialism, 20th century socialism, and the gates of hell itself. The president recently declared a state of emergency in order to, quote, tend our country, tend to our country, and more importantly, to prepare to denounce, neutralize, and overcome the external and foreign aggressions against our country. Um, he believes that the U.S. is uh, working its way towards supporting a coup. So what is going on? Well, it's a nightmare. Public services are collapsing. Um, medical care, uh, which was made free for everyone in 1999. Um, electricity, uh, rolling blackouts, even in the uh, major cities. Uh, water is a big problem. We'll get into that in more detail. Inflation is uh, topping 700% at the moment and is uh, slated to even rise further next year there is an unimaginably huge crime wave that is trapping people indoors at night where because there's no electricity they have to try and sleep in 100 degree heat without air conditioning it's um like an updated swarthy soviet style of shopping in that uh, shoppers have to stand in blistering heat for hours on end just to try to get food the day the uh, hospitals are full of dying babies infant mortality is going through the roof because the socialized Venezuelan healthcare system has, as it is estimated, only 20% of the medicine that it needs to treat basic ailments. Recently, massive injuries and two deaths were reported when 5,000 looters stripped supermarket shelves of everything they could lay their hands on. The American response has been that recently Barack Obama extended an executive order that imposed sanctions on top Venezuelan officials and declared the South American country a national security threat to the United States. How bad is it getting? Well, recently, Ramon Muchacho, the mayor of the middle-class Caracas borough of Chacao, said on Twitter that people were hunting, quote, dogs and cats in the streets and pigeons in the plazas to eat them because of food scarcity and the high cost of living. On April 27th, the Venezuelan Chamber of Food reported that the country's food producers only had 15 days left 
of inventory. Uh, this, of course, is extraordinarily and deeply alarming. According to the Wall Street Journal, Chavez confiscated the country's most productive farms and turned them over to Chavistas, who didn't know how to farm. Even on farms that were not seized, planting is diminished. Most seeds used in Venezuela are imported. And without dollars, they can't be imported because you can't exchange. Farmers are reluctant to plant when the costs are high and the harvests are price controlled. Dairy farms are also less productive now that daily power outages shut down electricity-powered milking machines. Trucks carrying food cargo are often hijacked. Oscar Meitzer, director of the Documentation Center for Social Analysis, said that measurements of scarcity and inflation in May are going to be the worst to date. Quote, We are officially declaring May as the month that widespread hunger began in Venezuela, he told Web Noticias Venezuela. As for March, there was an increase in yearly prices due to inflation, a 582.9% increase for food, while the level of scarcity of basic products remains at 41.37%. Venezuela has virtually run out of food and water and medical supplies, currency, electricity, and toilet paper. The government has responded by leaping into action and spending the last two years fingerprinting shoppers to prevent hoarding, which has been made illegal. This is an unbelievably grim and dangerous situation, and I, 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 my heart goes out to the heartbreak and heart, heartache and hunger and, and heat and frustration and rage of the Venezuelan people. Have you heard a lot about this from the mainstream media? A little here and there, although the causes are always obscured. But no, you basically haven't heard much about this because, you see, what Donald Trump said to some Miss Universe contestant years ago is apparently really, really important. Over 33 million people sliding into a socialist, Stalinist-style hell of failed statehood. Well, how important is that? How's Megan doing with Donald? Now, Venezuela has ostensibly had free health care for all since 1999, long relied on imported Cuban doctors to make good on that promise to the people. Um, so they really have very little medicine and the equipment is all old and falling apart. But hey, at least it's free. Venezuela's currency is called the Bolivar, and it's worth less than a penny on the black market exchange. So it's true that they've run out of toilet paper in Venezuela, but on the plus side, at least you can use the Bolivar as toilet paper, probably be more effective. And there's a, a terrifying story of a guy running a manufacturing plant. He has a contract with his union to always make sure that there's toilet paper on hand in his factory's bathrooms. But of course, as the price of toilet paper went up, or at least struggled to over the price controls, the employees just pilfered all of the toilet paper from the uh, manufacturing plant's bathrooms. So then, in order to fulfill his contract, he had to go to the black market where he was caught by the police, and they initially demanded hundreds of thousands of dollars to let him off the charges. He's since barked them down to about 10000 or $20,000, and this is what it's like to do business in certain areas of Venezuela. So what the hell is going on in Venezuela? People when read this in the media, they'll say, well, you see, there's a drought. And well, you see, the price of oil has gone down and Venezuela is a huge exporter of oil. So therefore, 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 but this is nonsense. This is nonsense for reasons we'll get into in a moment. First thing you need to know about Venezuela, it's sitting on top of the world's largest reserves of oil, bigger than Saudi Arabia. Over 300 billion barrels are credibly estimated under the soil of Venezuela. It has about 50, 50 billion barrels in current assets. So when the price of oil was very high, it was a big oil boom that's just tapering off at the moment. Over the past 17 years, first under Hugo Chavez, the government plundered over a trillion dollars in oil revenues. And did they do smart things like, I don't know, hedge the price of oil? So if the price of oil goes down, you don't end up having to lean too hard on the taxpayers? So under Hugo Chavez, now under Maduro, trillion dollars, yeah. Oil prices have fallen, so you hedge, you short, you manage your risks if you have half a brain. And even in 2014, when oil was over $100 a barrel, there were still acute shortages of bread and toiletries in Venezuela. So this blaming of external forces is nonsense. Now, one of the big problems, of course, is that Chavez nationalized the oil industry and uh, in conflicts with the unions ended up driving many oil workers north into Canada. 
And now because Venezuela, as an oil-rich nation, thought it was very smart to run its electricity off hydroelectric dams and uh, did not build any backup generators. So now that there's been a drought and the 20-year non-investment uh, in a lot of the infrastructure is causing it to fail, well, Venezuela lacks the electricity to run a lot of its oil pumps and the resulting crude is so crappy that it barely gets in the mid-teens of dollars per barrel. Now, in an effort to save power, government workers, at least non-essential government workers, are now down to two days' work a week. Now, there is a drought in Venezuela, which is stretching across other countries as well. But it's not that there's a drought. These are external triggers. You know, if I don't maintain my car and the brakes fail, I can say, well, I crashed because the brakes failed. But the reality was that I simply didn't maintain my car, and that's why the brakes ended up failing. The fundamental problem in Venezuela is that electricity is basically free. It's massively subsidized for the middle class and the poor illegally jack into the system and are rarely policed. So what do people do? Well, when something's free, you don't bother conserve it. You leave your TV on, you leave your computer running, you leave your air conditioner running. Drought is all the way across Latin America, but not every country in Latin America is going through this. So... One of the big problems is uh, when Hugo Chavez came in, uh, it uh, developed this kind of cool macho man economic socialism called Chavismo. Uh, this is government management of the economy, general socialist price fixing, price and currency controls, massive corruption, government mismanagement, malinvestment. They, the government um, nationalized the, a lot of the oil industry and uh, then uh, poured I don't know, untold millions of dollars into a really, really bad Formula One racer called something like El Crasho, because he barely makes it through a race without crashing. And he is the advertising mascot for the government monopoly. Why you need an advertising mascot for a monopoly is beyond me, but this is the kind of nonsense that's going on. So it's just the usual socialist nightmare. And uh, the U.S. leftists, by which in general it's the mainstream media, you know, they, recur, uh, they refer to people like Nicolas Maduro and Raul Castro of Cuba as presidents, whereas people like uh, Alfredo Stroessner of Paraguay, Paraguay and Augusto Pinochet of Chile are referred to as dictators, although none of them were elected in free and fair elections. And, uh, you know, if the left likes your dictatorship, in other words, if it's a left-wing dictatorship, you're called a president. If it's a more military or right-wing dictatorship, regardless of how it positively affects the population, well, you're just called a dictator because, yay, objective mainstream media. Now, government price controls are a disaster everywhere they're tried. Every economist worth his or her salt clearly states this. It is beyond the realm of theory into grim, repetitive, actual practice. The price controls in Venezuela apply to goods, vital medicines, car batteries, medical services, deodorant, diapers, and, of course, toilet paper. Venezuela doesn't even have enough money or energy to produce more of the currency that it pretends has value. So price controls, just very briefly, when you set price controls, that is usually a response to massive printing of money. Inflation is an inflation of the money supply. It only later ends up as inflation, which is generally understood as an increase in prices. You know, if you have 10 apples and $10, then each apple is going to be worth a dollar. If you have 10 apples and $20, then each apple is going to be worth $2. So it's going to require $2 to buy. So when you have price controls, you are setting the price that a good can be sold at below what it costs to produce and transport it along with some profit. And all that means is that the goods vanish. They vanish from circulation. And this, of course, is what is happening to food. When you socialize things, when you take things over, people lose the incentive to produce uh, and uh, therefore you get all of this mess. And, and the usual hell has erupted in terms of a, um, a black market and a gray market that is attempting to provide goods um, while dodging the state guns and policemen, uh, provide goods and services to people as a whole. So price controls are always a complete disaster. So the IMF reports that prices will rise by 720% in 2016 and a jaw-dropping 2,200% 2 in 2017. And these prices are going up, this inflation is going up, despite the fact that not only is electricity virtually free, but gasoline is virtually free in Venezuela. It costs about five cents a liter, which is such a nominal fee that few people even bother to collect it. In the medical field, it's a complete disaster. 
AIDS patients can't get medicines, cancer patients can't even find chemotherapy drugs, even malaria, which was eliminated from Venezuela a generation ago, is making a horrifying comeback. Law and order have collapsed. Caracas, the capital, has been recently calculated as one of the most murderous cities in the world. There are repetitive grenade attacks and uh, anti-tank rocket launchers are making an appearance. It's basically not a city, it's a first-person shooter where you're either targeted or you're trying to target a pigeon for dinner. Now, the water infrastructure in Venezuela and other cities is falling apart after nearly 20 years of socialist neglect. Water utilities, of course, not able to raise prices, so what have they done? Well, they can't raise prices to control the use of water, so you impose harsh rationing. So people in Venezuela are going for days or even weeks with no piped water. So what do they do? They fill up buckets and tubs and whatever they can, barrels, which, you know, provides the exact stagnant water that is a giant breeding bat for endless mosquitoes. And this adds to outbreaks of chikungunya, chikungunya, dengue fever, malaria, and the new fresh hell off the block, Zika. So uh, it is a complete disaster. Now, the president is saying, well, you know, the U.S. is, is trying to take us over. And there are reports that the U.S. supported a military coup in Venezuela in 2002. And the reason that the Venezuelans believe when Maduro and Chavez say that the U.S. is trying to oust them, well, there was a Guatemalan coup supported by the U.S. government in 1954, the invasion of Panama, whatever the hell happened in Haiti in 2004. And uh, this is basically because of the Roosevelt colliery to the Monroe Doctrine, and uh, this is the price that is paid for U.S. involvement in foreign conflicts, which hopefully is going to come to a gradual halt relatively soon. But this is what is going on. The fact that the U.S. gets involved in these rebellions and in, in funding these coups and arming rebels and so on means that the current dictators can blame outside forces for problems and have some credibility with the people. Now... Let's just take a moment here. I talked about this in a recent call-in show. Let's vault over Sting's sycophantic squealing to socialism. They dance alone. Let's talk about Chile. So remember, evil. Pinochet, evil dictator, all those free market Chicago boys under Milton Friedman, they went to Chile to help it become a free market economy, and it was just, it was terrible, and they tortured Ripley, and it was just a, a complete uh, evil, 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 evil. You know, the socialism in Venezuela was perfectly wonderful, but the free market in Chile was absolutely, completely, and totally wrong. My God, do you know in Chile, they even have a voucher system and have choice over the education of their children? That voucher system was actually designed by Milton Friedman, one of the greatest free market economists of all time. So Chile went free market Venezuela went socialist. And this, my friends, this is why you're not hearing about the successes in Chile and you're not being told the root causes of the untold disasters in Venezuela because the media is a leftist monstrosity in general. The mainstream media is a leftist monstrosity. This goes against the narrative, the fact that Chile is vastly succeeding and the fact that Venezuela is falling into a giant sinkhole of socialist straight to the bottom hell doesn't fit the narrative of free market bad, socialism good, free market unkind, socialism just a loving hug from a soft heroin dealer. So for 30 years, Chile has been a labor laboratory for free market economics, right? Privatized pensions, a school voucher system designed by Milton Friedman, as I mentioned. It is a very powerful laboratory for what is possible. So since 1950, GDP per person in capitalist Chile, grew 350%. In socialist Venezuela, 23%. And I would argue that it's probably going to slip closer into negative territory. GDP per person in capitalist Chile grew 350%. In socialist Venezuela, 23% or less. So this is from a few years ago, some facts about Chile. The 10th freest economy in the world. It's the most free economy in Latin America. It has the highest quality of life indices in Latin America. The, the, the third highest in all of America, only after America and Canada. America, Canada, Chile. 
GDP per capita is over 17,000 US and growing rapidly, and only 11% of the population in Chile live below the poverty line. Only 11% of the population in Chile live below the poverty line. And that is 70% now in Venezuela. Do you see why I am constantly and constantly and constantly pushing and prompting and passionately caterwauling for the virtues of the free market? It saves lives. It stabilizes societies. It heals children of illness. It keeps babies alive. It keeps the elderly alive. That's what the free market does. And socialism is a giant hobnail boot on the face, hearts, hopes, and balls of humanity from here to eternity. Now, Chile, is it not subject to oil price fluctuations? Is it not subject to droughts? Well, of course it is. Now, Chile doesn't even have any significant reserves of fossil fuels. It's got some copper, which uh, is not unimportant, particularly in the growth economies of India and China, but no significant fossil fuels. So it's not sitting on the staggering world's biggest ever lottery winner of Western fuel demand for oil that Venezuela is sitting on. So that's Chile. That's Chile. Okay, Venezuela. Chile, 10th freest economy in the world. Venezuela, 144th most free economy in the world. Basically, least free. It's the least free economy in Latin America. It has the third worst quality of life indices in Latin America. It has one of the highest murder rates in the world. And it has the largest proven oil reserves in the world. Chile, 11% below poverty line. Venezuela, 70%. Since 1970, real incomes in Venezuela have shrunk by 14% while increasing by 216% in Chile. I'm going to say that again. You need to get this. This is what the free market does. Real incomes in Venezuela since 1970 shrunk by 14%, increased by 216% in Chile. By the way, they're mostly stagnant in the Western world because the government keeps growing and growing and growing. Now, this is another reason why Donald Trump is gaining some traction, to put it mildly, in American politics. Leftists promote policies that, dis- that cripple and destroy countries. And then they cripple America's ability to control its borders. So leftist socialist policies um, uh, harped on for, um, you can read um, uh, Naomi Klein for more of this, the shock doctrine. Yeah, the shock doctrine calls we're bringing you back to life. But uh, leftists promote these policies that completely destroy economies and then cripple America's ability to control its borders. And, uh, you know, if free market policies were being pursued in Mexico, in Guatemala, in Argentina, in Brazil, as they are being in Chile, well, then you wouldn't need to worry so much about border controls because here's a statement. Here's a statement. It's all you need to know about the border and the economy. Here I am crawling through barbed wire over landmines through rivers and mountains so that I can escape the evils of free market capitalism, said no one ever.